World War II is one of the worst periods in human history. From 1939 to 1945, anywhere between 70 million and 85 million people were killed, which was 3% of the world population back then. Arguably, the worst part about the Second World War was the brutal reign of the Nazi Party in Nazi Germany. I would describe them, but you know we've all been in history class at some point, and we all know who they are, so I won't dwell on it. Nazi Germany was a brutal country that overtook many countries in Europe, including Poland, Czechoslovakia, and France. These large countries had huge armies who failed to resist the German army. Up until the end of the war, very few groups managed to successfully resist the Germans. One of those attempts that worked was not done by an armed resistance militia or even a rogue intelligence operation. It was actually done by four scientists on a Norwegian island that nobody has actually heard of. This is Island X, better known as Jan Mayen. Many people have heard of Svalbard. It's an archipelago in the Arctic Sea that is owned by Norway and is known for being an excellent location to view the northern lights and also for being one of the northernmost settlements in the world. Oftentimes when you look at Svalbard as a location, it's listed as Svalbard and Jan Mayen. But if you were to look at a map of Svalbard, you'd see that there isn't a place called Jan Mayen anywhere near it. That's because Jan Mayen is actually located 1,050 kilometers or about 652 miles away from Svalbard right here in the middle of nowhere. So you may be wondering what exactly this island is and what its history is, and that's a tale that I'm going to tell. Jan Mayen could have been sighted as early as the 5th century AD, but its first confirmed sightings happened in the 17th century. An expedition of ships funded by the Dutch Nord Compagnie was searching for whaling bases in the Arctic Ocean in the year 1614. These ships were the Gauden Cass and the Orangian Boom. They hadn't found anything of major interest for the majority of their trip until around July. Sometime during that month, the cartographer aboard the Gauden Cast sighted an island. They approached it and landed on the island, and they eventually named it Juris Island after the cartographer who discovered it. The crew of the Gauden Cast soon noticed that another ship had already arrived on the island. This ship was the Klein Swetengen, another Dutch ship funded by shareholders of the Norse Compagnie. The Gauden Cast assumed that the Klein Swetengen would report their discovery to the States General of the Netherlands, and so they didn't report it. However, the Klein Swetengen's financial backers decided to keep the discovery a secret for their own financial gain. Because the island's discovery wasn't reported, it was found and discovered again by an English whaler, and it was dubbed Sir Thomas Smith's Island. Jan Mayen was first called Jan Mayen on a map printed in 1620 by Willem Jansch Blau. Its name came from the captain of the Gaudenkath, Captain Jan Jacob Schoon Mai van Schellenkout, or more colloquially known as Captain Jan Mai. Its name didn't reach widespread use until 1623 when Blau published an atlas called Ziegspiegel, which detailed the island. Not much happened on the island for the next hundred years outside of whaling in an interesting event where Danish whalers were expelled from the island, so they burnt down the island's buildings in revenge. Soon, whaling around the island began to lose profits due to the overhunting of whales, and gradually the island was fading from occupation. But then the first international poldy year began in 1882, and a group of Austria-Hungarian scientists set up a station on the island. Sometime during the 1910s, Norwegian fur trappers discovered the island and accidentally hunted the native Arctic fox population to local extinction. After World War I, the League of Nations was distributing territories to countries left and right. Both the Netherlands and Norway had claimed Svalbard and Jan Mayen, and the League of Nations gave jurisdiction of the islands to Norway. In 1921, the Norwegian Meteorological Institute constructed a weather station, which quickly became the most important part of the island. The station was served by a rotating crew of four scientists, most notably the Russian-born Gennady Alonkin. Alonkin served on Jan Mayen for five one-year terms, from 1928 until 1936. His service to the island led him to become the namesake of the island's capital, Alonkinbayan. So now this part of Jan Mayen's history is where it gets interesting. You've probably noticed that I haven't mentioned anything about Nazis or Germany or anything related to the Second World War. Well, that's about to change. At the beginning of World War II, Sweden was a neutral country that was exporting iron ore to Nazi Germany through Norway. The United Kingdom did not like that, so they put mines in the waters around Norway. The Germans, wanting to secure their supply of iron ore, invaded Denmark and Norway in the spring of 1940. But what effect did this have on Jan Mayen? Well, the purpose of Jan Mayen Station was to send weather reports to Norway detailing Arctic weather patterns. The Germans, for some reason, deemed this information useful and began to receive reports for Jan Mayen. However, the scientists based at the station had a different idea. They, like most people in countries occupied by Nazi Germany, were not a fan of the Nazis, and realized that, since they were most most likely isolated enough from the Germans, they could probably get away with any act of defiance. So they pulled what could be seen as a very small yet very courageous move. They stopped sending their reports 
to mainland Norway. Instead, they sent them to the United Kingdom. The UK took notice of this and made a sort of alliance with Jan Mayen, and they gave it the code name Island X. Soon after the alliance took place, the British began sending reinforcements to Jan Mayen in order to protect it from the almost guaranteed German retaliation. The British had a ship of reinforcements en route to Jan Mayen when a Norwegian patrol boat called the Fridtjof Nansen ran aground off the coast of the island, and 68 Norwegian soldiers took refuge on the island. Realizing the hazard of maintaining a constant British presence after the sinking, the commander of the expedition decided to abandon Jan Mayen altogether. When the ship of reinforcements arrived to Jan Mayen, they were loaded with the four scientists and 68 stranded Norwegians and sent back to England. However, before they left the island, they destroyed the weather station to prevent the Germans from utilizing it. In late 1940, the Germans attempted to land weathermen on Jan Mayen and take the island for themselves. However, they also realized the unsafety of the island as their naval trawler ran aground off the coast of the island, and by the time they had arrived on shore, they were arrested by a crew from a British destroyer who had spotted them on the radar. Sometime in 1941, a 12-man crew of weathermen from Norway came to the island and constructed a new weather station called Gamla Metten. The weather reports from the station alerted the occupying Germans that there was now another Norwegian presence on the island, and they began to bomb the island constantly, which didn't really have much of an impact on the island. Soon, Britain had sent the island supplies, soldiers, and anti-aircraft guns, which discouraged the Germans, who scaled back their air raids by late 1940. The German air raids scaled back even more after a German Condor bomber crashed on the island in 1942, resulting in a loss of its entire crew. In 1943, American soldiers came onto the island and established a radio station called Radio Jan Mayen in a settlement they called Atlantic City, meant to locate German bases in Greenland. Radio Jan Mayen existed throughout the rest of the war and was abandoned in 1946 and then blown into the ocean during a storm in 1954. So that is the story of how four Norwegian meteorologists stood up to one of the largest and most brutal empires of the 20th century. So what is Jan Mayen like now you may be asking? Well, it's about the same. It had an airfield constructed called Jan Mayen's Field in 1958 out of a stretch of road, it has a population of a staggering 35 people, mainly scientists and their families, in its two cities called Alonkenbein and Papebu. Jan Mayen may have once been a major whaling hub and an unexpected force of resistance against the Nazis, but the island's glory days are most likely long over, and the island now remains a forgotten, isolated, and desolate weather station which it will likely remain forever.